and you are tuned to Grecian Echoes. It's Mondays with Meleti, and your host, Meleti Filiopoulos. And at this time, we have a very special guest that was joining us by telephone, uh, Mr. Jonathan Alexander Exados. He's the author of the book, A Village Murder, uh, which was released in paperback in uh, 2018. And he is, his great-grandfather had witnessed uh, the murder of his father and his grandfather. And uh, the story is set around immigration, uh, around the villages, first of Pendalafos and then of Yerinos in Greece, and the story of family and trust, and uh, all set in historical context. Uh, good morning, Jonathan. Alimera, how are you doing? Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you for calling in this morning. Did it did it snow out your way? It did not snow. Uh, we had a lot of rain yesterday. It's clearing up right now, and uh, but it is still cold. It's still in the uh, upper 30s right now. So, oh. Uh, we'll still get outside today, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah, that's good. That's good. Thank you for calling in this morning. I, uh, You know that I had read your book uh, last week, and I just fell in love with it. So I want to thank you for writing such a great story and ask you uh, about first about the spark. Where did you get the interest uh, in this particular story and in your family history? Okay. Well, first of all, though, it's my pleasure to be here. I really appreciate you uh, interviewing me today and uh, getting the word out about uh, my work. Uh, it's really meaningful to me. Um, the spark uh, for me, um, and I think I was telling you this when we first spoke, um, I've always had a strong interest in my uh, ancestry, even as a young child. Uh, I remember playing on the steps of my uh, grandparents' uh, home uh, that into the uh, bedrooms, and along the steps, pictures of the ancestors, their parents, their grandparents, and I would always look and ask about them and who they were. And uh, one picture stood out to me, uh, a tall gentleman uh, who I was told was my great-grandfather, Alexander, and I was told that uh, he was beheaded. Uh, and I was told this when I was a young child, and at that time, when you're a kid and that's all the information you're getting, you have to wonder to yourself, you know, why was he beheaded? Was he, was he a criminal? Was he attacked by someone? Was he in the war? Uh, what type of war might he have been? So uh, that kind of stuck with me all through the years. But I never uh, was told as a child, you know, why. I did ask my grandfather once. And he just, his head just looked down and he just refused to, to say anything, not not out of anger or anything, but I could tell he was upset about the subject being brought up. And um, it was his wife, my grandmother, Jenny, who told me a little bit about the story. Um, and then uh, my uncle Jimmy Exeropoulos told me the story uh, that he knew uh, when I was visiting uh, up there in Cape Cod and vacationing in Cape Cod as a, as a teenager with my family. So uh -huh. that's, that's what... Yeah. That is really something, and um, of course, Jimmy, we, we miss him so much. He, uh, for our listeners, know uh, that he had passed away this past year, um, and just a wonderful person. Uh, so he chose you to tell you the story, and uh, had you asked him before? I had never asked him, uh, although when we were at his uh, pizza restaurant, um, you know, I was asking about the relatives. I was asking about uh, ancestry, and that's when he just came right out and told me the, the story from what he knew. Uh, all the stories, uh, you know, that we've heard are passed down word of mouth. Of course, there's no one alive today that was... Uh, uh, that was there at the time, that was a witness or even was a, a young child uh, when the uh, murders took place in uh, 1928. So uh, everything is word of mouth and family history um, as far as that was concerned and from what I learned at that time. And then I had to do some research and find out, uh, you know, if there was any documentation about these murders. And sure enough, there was. Really? Now, how did you find that? Well, um, I had come across uh, quite a few documents that were given to me um, when I visited uh, Afghanistan, um, you know, in 2016, 
and I couldn't read them. I, I was asking my, my father and uh, my aunts and uncles, you know, can you read this? And apparently it was in an old style uh, writing, uh, Greek writing, Greek style. So uh, I did some research online and I found a gentleman in Crete who was a scholar uh, who could read and um, who could uh, translate the documents for me. And he was fascinated with the story after I spoke with him, and he decided to go and do some research on his own. And he just came up with, you know, all these newspaper uh, clippings and articles about the uh, the murder and what took place. Uh, and it was a double murder uh, that took place of uh, my great grandfather and his father. Um, and uh, you know, that's when it just kind of opened up. And it was interesting because I wanted to write this story, but it just opened up more avenues and. Uh, gave me more characters to write about uh, with the story, including uh, the, that one gentleman that you said you found fascinating, Marcos Trimpos, the, the gentleman who tried tracking down these uh, bandits who did the murders and right. brought them to jail. Yep. Mm-hmm. Would you, when, you, when you went to Avgerinos, were, were there people that were aware of the story, um, that, that there were beheadings near in the village in the early years, or has that pretty much been dropped? So I will have to say that the murders that took place back in 1928 still affect the people of Avgerinos today. Um, they are fascinated with the story. Each has their own little, you know, uh, like when you, when you do telephone, you have to play the game telephone, and it, it <laughs> yeah. evolves into stories, you know, but right. it all boils down to pretty much the same thing. And uh, the second time when I went um, to Avgerinos after I had written the book, uh, and I went there in 2018, um, my wife and uh, her niece, who I we came along with us on the trip, mm-hmm. they were down at a little fruit vending stand, and uh, I, you know, I was walking in the village and talking with some people and everything, and I came down to the stand, and I'm there, I'm looking and seeing what they're doing, and a little little old gentleman taps me on the shoulder. Uh, this guy, I mean, he had to be in his 90s, and he had a cane. And he looked at me, and in Greek, he said, you look like an exorhopolis. And I said, well, <laughs> I am an exorhopolis. <laughs> That's so great, yeah. So he made a motion across his neck, like the head being cut off, and he was telling me in Greek, which I could, I don't understand Greek very well, but I can understand a little bit, mm. but he was telling me about, you know, my ancestors and how they were murdered so here was this little old man who i'd never met before recognizing me as an exorhopolis in the, in the village and telling me about the story in greek you know that he knew which was i thought was fascinating to me yeah that's that's an, that's just amazing and um I, I you know i don't want to give away too much of the story but i i think it's one of those that i know that i'm going to go back to again and again you've written it and you've told it so well but you didn't start with the murders did you you started on your great great grandmother's side and to her village of pendalafos and which i thought was really beautiful so you you um brought your grandparents or great-grandparents over. And uh, I thought that was pretty interesting. So for, for the research from Pendalafos, um, who did you have to help you with that? Or how did you discover all of that? Um, a lot of that was uh, through the documentation that I had received as far as uh, the immigration uh, documentation of when she actually came to the country, uh, birth, uh, birth dates. Uh, so w- one of the things I found extremely fascinating about this story was that uh, when I'm looking at these documents and I'm looking at when she immigrated, when her husband Alexander uh, immigrated, they were so young. I mean, Alexander, you know, immigrated here when he was 15 years old. She lied about, well, the family lied about her age, made them a little bit older, but she was actually 14 years old when she and her best friend Chrissy uh you know, immigrated by themselves. I by mean, you could imagine yeah. sending your 14 and 15 year old child across the ocean, you know, to, to go and make their way in the shoe factories in another country. And, um, you know, when they didn't have cell phones, you can contact, you couldn't text each other back then. <laughs> you <know? laughs> well, you, you had described that whole journey, I think, so well and, and um, with such imagination, but something that was it's probably a little true that most people would picture being on a boat crossing the Atlantic, coming from, by the way, a small village up in the mountains, 
And as you as you say, like going out into the world as such a young person, but a lot of people experience, you know, uh, trips like that through cruise ships, and they think, oh, well, even if they're in third class, you know, it's not. But you really painted the 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 grueling um, thing that they had to endure. Uh, it's just the uh, yeah the best teachers I've ever had in my life uh, growing up in you know junior high high school and college were the ones who didn't just give you the facts and the dates yeah. they were the ones who would be up in front of the the chalkboard describing what these people went through during these historical periods what it was like what they were eating what they were wearing and they would paint this picture. And that's when I, you know, became fascinated with history because of these specific teachers. I'm, I'm terrible with um, memorization of facts and then regurgitation on a text. I was horrible at that. You know? <laughs> but you, you give me a story and you tell me what's going on in that person's life or what's going on in, in the world at that time, and I, I'm hooked. And that's what I wanted to do with this book. I wanted to bring the reader to that moment so right. that they could not be, see it and touch it and feel it, but experience that, you know, again, if I just tell you this, ah, oh, they got on a ship and then they went across the sea and the <laughs> ocean, you know, it took three weeks to do so, and it's big deal. But if I tell you exactly how these people felt and the odors of the ship uh -huh. or how uncomfortable it was or the clothes you were wearing and you didn't take a shower for three weeks, you know, if I tell you that and it bring you into the story, it's going to make it much more of an interesting, uh, you know, read for the uh, for the reader. And that was one of my my goals. Yeah, it's you know, and I I, I mentioned to the listeners last week, and I'll, I'll say it again, how the book had come to me um, in our our library up at the St. George Greek Orthodox Cathedral in Manchester, New Hampshire. Uh, we had a book that was um, the, the priest, the new priest came in. He said, oh, there are these books that were in the office here. And there was A Village Murder by Jonathan Alexander Exaros. And I opened it up and I saw the name Exarchopoulos. And then I saw your letter saying that um, your great-grandparents had come to Manchester, New Hampshire when they first came to America. And I, I thought that was fascinating. And then they, then they had immigrated to, to Marlborough. And you talk about that. You talk about them working in the mills and, um, you know, trying to save up money for each step of their lives, you know. And it, it just, um, I think I, I was relating to my own experience or my, my family's experience. And I think people can do that with your book. Uh, it, it's that kind of a thing. So uh, here you had come to Massachusetts, as I understand, and you had done a book signing, was it, at the Marlboro Church? Uh, yes, I did that uh, a few years ago, uh, before COVID hit. Before mm -hmm. COVID hit, right. And I noticed a picture on the Internet that you were doing a book signing at Barnes & Noble. Yes, I've done quite a few Barnes & Noble uh, book signings. Um, usually I'll do them more local. I do local uh, book signings whenever they pop up. Uh, so, yeah, I'm, I'm always anxious to get out there and, and do that and just speak about the book and talk to people. So uh, as an author, you know, um, you don't you don't sell a whole lot of books at book signings. It's just a matter of getting out there and speaking with people and, uh, you know, uh, getting your work out there for, for someone who may be interested. So uh, it's well worth it to me, you know, spending two, three hours at a book signing uh, to, uh, you know, to speak about this work that I've done. You know, if you're going to find people that are going to come up to you and they're going to say, like we saw on Facebook when we posted this, uh, someone said, oh, my family was from Avietinos. And so, you know, there, there, there's an interest where most of us are immigrants uh, that came here and or the child or, you know, our ancestors had immigrated. So that whole experience or we, we even had some sort of salty thing in our past, um, like a murder. And um, so it's it's uh, it's relevant for a lot of people and relevant right now in Greek American studies. I wanted to ask you about the writing process for you, um, because the book just flowed so well. I mean, when people say it was a page turner, it was a page turner. And I, I wanted, did, did you write it and then all at once? Or how did you, what was the process like for you? 
Oh, thank you for uh, the compliment. But uh, yeah, so um, I had a, a couple of goals or a few goals in mind when I wrote this book. Um, but one of the goals that I had was to write a book that was easy enough to read, that wasn't pretentious. In other words, I didn't, I, I've read plenty of books where it is clear the author is trying to show off how knowledgeable they are by, you know, going through a thesaurus and using flowery words that we don't use in our everyday, you know, conversation. Right. Uh, I didn't want it to be pretentious, and I also didn't want it to come off sophomoric. You know, like a like a sixth grader wrote it. <laughs> you know, yeah. it should be something that somebody uh, who's educated could uh, could write. Um, so I wrote it in that way, and let me tell you, the editing process, and and this is the the thing that uh, if I'm, if we have any potential authors out there or authors who are writing books right now, and there's quite a few of them, uh, people who are always interested in writing their story. But the editing process is the most grueling process. You have to reread and reread again your book over and over again and go through everything and make sure that you have uh, phrases that are not repeated, um, you know, so that it, again, it flows from one thing to another without, you know, um, like I said, that repetition. I'll, I'll give you a little bit of an example. Uh, the phrase, he found himself. Okay, or she found herself. Hmm. Well, I found myself when I wrote that book, wrote, wrote the book and was reading through it over and over. I was using that phrase over and over and over again. Right. So I had to figure out and to come up with other ways of saying the same thing so that it wasn't repetitive. Um, but the writing style, the writing purpose was all so that a, a, a teenager could read it or somebody who was highly educated could read it and appreciate it and feel like this was something that, you know, was capturing their interest and, you know, could, uh, you know, they could relate to. Now, did you, did you share the manuscript as you were going along? Did you share it with anyone and said, you know, let me know what you think? And uh, did anyone collaborate with you in that way? Absolutely. Yeah. I had, um, you know, my mother, I had a couple of friends, uh, and I've, I've credited these people in the, in the book as well. Uh, I wanted somebody who was not a family member, uh, to read the manuscript to see, uh, you know, how they felt. And, you know, every single time, I mean, I got some, some feedback on, you know, a couple things with the writing style or, uh, some words that were either missing or whatever it is, classic, you know, uh, typos and that type of thing. But, uh, from the start, um, you know, I was starting to get a feeling that I was knocking this out of the park uh, yeah. with the way it was written, um, you know, with the feedback that I was receiving. Right. And once you decided to start uh, and in the um, in the villages with the migra migration, immigration to America, then it was a matter of getting them back and going through the murder, which you have said in a beautiful historical context, let's say, uh, that there were bandits in those years that came down. And it sort of reminded me a little bit like the mafia, you know, coming into your store and saying, you know, you're, you, you got to pay for our protection, that sort of thing. And, it was exactly, uh, the, uh, it was exactly, you know, like a mafia it was a modern day mafia. They were, they were extorting people. They were holding people hostage. Right. They were rob robbing the cheese traders. Um, I mean, it was just horrendous what they read. And it was all over the country. It was yeah. all over Greece, all the way down to Lefkada and down to Athens. Um, different bands of these mafioso type of, uh, you know, clubs and groups that would band together and do this and uh, prey upon the people of Greece. So uh, it was, uh, yeah, it was interesting to learn about that, too. I mean, that was something that I had never learned about in my studies before. Yeah. You know, I did this. Yeah, and and there's there's a part of the story that that deals with betrayal, trust, and betrayal, and and that human condition that comes up in our lives all the time. Someone who's jealous of somewhere someone else, and does something, and then it just goes and gets worse and worse and worse, and then the vendetta that was out there, and I mean that it's just uh, just so it really grabbed me. I have to tell you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that was interesting to write about that uh, that gentleman too, um, who did the betrayal and who sought out that vendetta. Um, you know, I'm, I, again, I don't want to give too much. You, neither of us want to give too much away in the book, but right. uh, 
you know, as I wrote about that character, uh, that individual, I, I actually, to be honest with you, even though he betrayed my family and my, you know, family members were killed over, you know, what he did and he wasn't the, 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 the best of human beings out there. Um, almost had some, like, I don't know if I want to call it empathy or sympathy for the guy, you know, especially going through what he did. And, yeah. you know, again, we don't want to give away too much, but it was like, wow, I'm writing about this guy, and I, I kind of feel for him in a way, even though he was a baddie. <laughs> yeah, was I proud. know. I, I felt that way, too, but I felt that he had a chance. And he, he did. didn't he didn't redeem himself. He went further down the hole, and his jealousy, well, consumed him. And yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, our guest this morning is Jonathan Alexander Ixados. He's the author of the paperback, uh, A Village Murder, released in, uh, in paperback in 2018. Uh, it, it is available right now on Amazon. And uh, where else can they buy it, Jonathan? Is Amazon the primary way? Amazon, yeah. I think uh, we, we, we consider Amazon the primary because everybody uses Amazon nowadays. But it, it can be found in Barnes & Noble. Google Play, iTunes, uh, audiobook. It is an audiobook format right now. Uh, oh, great. Yeah, right. And you can get it in Kindle format as well on, on Amazon. Mm -hmm. It's just amazing. And, and we know uh, just from our discussions and our observations that they've been, the book has been added now to the collections at Harvard University, to the University of Chicago, and to the Tsakopoulos collection. And I'm sure you're going to be hearing from them. Uh, because I, I think it's just such a great book. <laughs> I'm so excited about it. I really am. I want to go back to the, the, the spark again, to Jimmy Exarchopoulos, who had told you uh, a little bit about the, the double murder and what he knew, and then a ask you, once you had done your research and you had talked to more people and you had gone to Avgerinos, did you bring something back to Jimmy that maybe he didn't know about the family or about his father? Yep. Yes. We, we spoke about that a little bit. Yeah, that was uh, amazing because here my Uncle Jimmy is telling me this story. And he told me this story of, uh, I, I could give a little bit of this away. It uh, doesn't, doesn't hurt the, uh, the reader to know. But um, there was a fight that broke out in the, uh, in the village uh, while they were building uh, the school uh, that uh, my great-great-grandfather wanted built for his uh, grandchildren. Um, and um, it, during the fight, one of the villagers bit the nose clean off of this this uh, villager who sought revenge later, of the gentleman we were talking about before. Mm. And um, my Uncle Jimmy was telling me, oh, a villager bit the nose off and did this. Stuff. Well, I come to find out that the villager who did the biting, who did the fight and everything, was his own father. His own father had oh. done that. And just he amazing. had no idea. Yeah, his, uh, <laughs> oh, no. His parents, yeah, it was amazing, too. To me, to find out, I came back and said, Uncle Jimmy, that was your father who did that. He says, really? I'm like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it was, uh, it was interesting to let him know that. But his, both of his parents passed away when he was very young, and he moved from the village as a child uh, to live with uh, an aunt and uncle in uh, Thessaloniki, and then, you know, he was always back to the village, back and forth and back and forth, but he didn't grow up there, and so, you know, when he's in the, in the village and he hears the stories being passed down, etc., there's a lot that was missing in there, and like I said, I, I, I uncovered so much, especially through those articles that were given to me by that uh, scholar in Crete, yeah. that uh, I am going far more and could piece it all together, you know, for everybody. But, uh, yeah, that was, that was interesting. <laughs> that, really? I can imagine his, what now, now learning that it was actually his father that did the biting, but the, right. the circumstance, you know, I, I, we know everyone now, Jimmy was just full of love. I mean, such a great, great, great person. And, and you had come, you, you know, we want to let the audience know that you are living in Pennsylvania. Is that where you grew up? Uh, yes, I was um, uh, basically an army brat initially. So um, I was born in Fort Sill, Oklahoma, yeah. uh, when my father was in the military. And then uh, he went off to Vietnam the first year that I was alive. And then when he got out of his uh, first tour of duty, uh, we moved to Athens, Greece, and we lived there for two years. So uh, oh. I lived there from age two to four, uh, oh. came home speaking fluently, and then unfortunately lost my ability to fluently <laughs> yeah. speak. 
but uh, yeah, yep. Yeah. And then, then from that point on, we we lived in New Jersey for about five years. Then when I was about ten years old, we moved here to Pennsylvania, and I live in uh, Central Bucks County. Oh, okay. Yeah. I know exactly where that is. Yeah. And you you had come. Uh, you said in the summers you would come and visit your relatives on this side and go and see your uncle Jimmy. And, yeah, correct. And so we uh, started uh, visiting Cape Cod, and that was our uh, two-week summer vacation, the first two weeks of August every year. And the highlight for me was always, let's go visit Uncle Jimmy, and I would go there. Quite, uh, also, I have to admit, when I was a teenager, I loved pizza. So yeah. Of course, you got to Uncle Jimmy, you're going to get free pizza from Uncle Jimmy. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. But yeah, I loved hanging out with Uncle Jimmy and sitting and hearing his stories and stuff in the restaurant. Uh, he, you know, and I was... Uh, I, I was thinking, what if he didn't tell you? You know, and and that's why we have to tell our stories. I think, you know. I think it's it's very important to uh, keep these stories alive. You know, and and that's the other thing. You know, when I wrote this book and that that other goal that I had, I, I wanted to memorialize and um, you know record exactly what happened uh, in written form. Um, but I also wanted to make sure that it was a story that other people could resonate with, uh, because, you know, you tell your story and it's interesting only to the people who are, you know, maybe your, your family members are the only ones who care. But if you can construct this story in a certain way that resonates with others, then they start, well, I have a relative who did something similar and, oh, my great grandparents immigrated here too. And it just sets out that little spark for them as well, I think. Right, right. I can see that happening. I can see if people came to to uh, hear you talk about the book, I can see them saying, oh, you know, my grandparents also, like I did, you know, oh, Manchester. And I found out that my, my grandfather, my Papu Meleti, when he had come, and the same years that your great-grandfather was there, um, they worked at the same place, at the Hoyt Shoe Factory, and that employed yeah. a lot of the Greeks. So just seeing that in the book, I'm like, wow, <laughs> this wow. is just great. What small world. So is this going to be, do you see yourself writing again, if, if, if inspired? Uh, do you have plans for another book? Yeah, I do have uh, plans for, you know, I keep every time I, uh, and that was the thing, when I wrote this book, I wasn't sure where it was going to go, how I was going to end it, but then it started coming to me. So sometimes you get into the process and it all happens, but I've, I've started a couple of books already and then I hit a brick wall because I've got to do, uh, I'm more interested in real stories, uh, true stories, yes. rather than just trying to make something up. Um, so some of the, uh, information, well, a lot of the information I have to do on these other two books that I'm interested in writing, I need to actually sit down and interview the people. And it, uh, that takes time and you got to, and the type of stories that I like to write, as you know, from reading the book, it can be harrowing experiences, you know, for the person who's telling the story. So timing has to be right, you know, with that. It does. Mm -hmm. It does. And I think, I think it's, it's, a, it's the right time in Greek American studies for this book to hit the market. So, so many people are, are interested in their roots and they're interested in that early immigration and the stories back in the village, just that you could reach back there and learn this. It's just, to me, it's just fascinating. I, I um, want to thank you so much for speaking with us this morning. And um, I hope that you'll come uh, sometime uh, to Boston and uh, that we can set up some, some speaking engagements for you. And I think once, uh, once maybe the cold weather passes or as soon as we can, let's do it. Well, I really appreciate you having me on your show today. And, um, yeah, absolutely. I'm, I'm always willing to do a little travel. And uh, coming up to Boston, again, it gives me a great excuse to go visit relatives. Not that I need an excuse. <laughs> I'll come up, I'll talk, and then I'll visit relatives and then just have a great time because uh, I love the area and I uh, would love to get out there and speak with everyone and be able to hang out with you as well, my friend. Yeah, that would be wonderful, Jonathan. Thank you so much. Have a great day. You too. Take care, everyone. Bye -bye. Thank you. Bye. Uh, that was our guest, Jonathan Alexander Exados. And uh, he's the author of the book, A Village Murder. And uh, you can go online. You can find that uh, in so many outlets, but uh, definitely out on Amazon and uh, read what people are saying about it. And uh, it's just incredible.